I just I think we need to be panicking about this erosion in the norm of nonviolence in Western liberal democracy. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kitten. And this is the show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant and returning guest today is an independent journalist and the author of Unmasked, Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. Nice neutral title there. Andy No, welcome back to Trigonometry. I'm very happy to be here again. Thank We're you. We're very happy to have you back, Andy. You've been doing some really important work. We had you on the show last time, shortly after you were assaulted, and we, we talked by Antifa, and we talked about that a lot. But since then, in April and May of 2020, we saw uh, the BLM protests and Antifa related to that really taking over several city centers in America, and you did some great work on that. So for anyone who doesn't know what Antifa is, who, who has never heard of this issue before, who maybe, frankly, hasn't ever seen any coverage because some of the stuff you've been posting on social media from footage from those scenes never made it to mainstream television or on news, certainly in this country. So just give everybody a big picture overview. What is Antifa? What has been happening in America for the last year? Antifa is a violent extremist movement of anarchists and communists with the explicit stated goal of destroying liberal democracies. So they've seen a significant rise, particularly since the election of Donald Trump um, after, in late 2016. And instead of just being a radical left, far left movement on the fringes, they've moved into the mainstream in America, first through periodic and frequent street brawls and riots in the cities like Portland, Berkeley, and Seattle, escalating to the point of throughout 2020, um, mass simultaneous riots in dozens of cities of coordinated street violence, arson attacks, the use of mortar explosives, and even in the case of where I'm from, Portland, uh, we had a homicide, a murder. And so they've taken over several city centers. Uh, I remember Chaz, and they've done another one in Portland uh, recently as well. Uh, and uh, what what is the because for a lot of people who again who haven't followed this, it's hard to tell like BLM protest Antifa. Is there a connection there? Are these two organizations working together? Uh, how do you see that part of it? They are working together. They do have different ultimate agendas. Broadly, Antifa are so they're made up of anarchist communists. So they believe that they can that we can organize society under communism without the use of a, um, a big government or totalitarian state. So this is why when you look at uh, the communes that they make, like communes or their autonomous zones, you look at the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, otherwise known as CHAZ, you look at the autonomous zone they have in Portland, they will create these sort of lawless areas where they say that they don't need the state, they don't need law enforcement, they don't need any type of order that they can take care of themselves. Also, of course, we know they can't take care of themselves. In the case of Chaz, we had two homicides there, uh, several shootings. Uh, in the case of Portland, it was literally creating a war zone in the middle of a residential area in Portland. Um, and you contrast that with BLM, which is in its theoretical underpinnings, very sort of classic revolutionary Marxists who are about um, sneaking into the institutions uh, of the state and mainstreaming their Marxist agenda. So, you know, there's a very systematic attack on free markets from BLM, and they're using it under the guise of racial justice. So there's a certain amount of overlap in terms of opposition to the state, particularly the United States of America, opposition to capitalism, uh, of course, opposition and hatred, murderous hatred of law enforcement. So because of that, there's been a certain uh, cross-pollination. And you've seen Antifa implement some of the intersectional ideology that's prevalent in BLM and also the usage of their chants, um, Black Lives Matter and all that. To the point now where when I describe Antifa, at least in America, I use BLM-Antifa because I really do think that they're uh, such linked entities. 
um, ultimately their ideologies will clash because one is calling for essentially a totalitarian state, BLM, whereas Antifa is calling for anarchy. So... Let's find out who wins that one. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, that would be very, very interesting. But, you know, we've got Antifa on one side, we've got BLM, but surely we need to take into account that there are a lot of people who march for BLM who have got no idea about Antifa, who've got no idea about, the, you know, these hardline Marxist views. Where do these people come in? The people who just go along and march and just want to see maybe social justice, maybe want to see black people being treated more fairly? Yeah, so um, I feel, I don't feel happy to describe them in this way, but I would call they're being used as useful idiots, essentially. So both these movements, Antifa and BLM, use the cloak of racial justice and social justice to shield themselves from criticism. So, for example, um, I have spoken vocally in opposition to Antifa, it led to me being beaten in 2019 and my family threatened and myself continually subject to death threats. And their response is, how could you be against a movement that calls itself anti-fascist? That if you're against anti-fascism, it means you're a fascist. If you're against Black Lives Matter, that means uh, you are against black people. So, you know, that this is what makes these movements so clever. It's a very... Uh, the branding of it in in the slogans and all that allow a certain amount of deflection of criticism. And unfortunately, they've used that very well in that in, um, the media has not really applied a critical lens on the ex- violent extremist rhetoric, the violent extremist ideology, and their violent extremist actions. So they've been given a free pass, essentially. So there are a lot of people on the left, I would say liberals, who obviously when they hear something like, uh, being against fascism, being against uh, black uh, anti-black uh, racism, uh, being against the racist police brutality. Like these are things they want to be a part of. And they go out to these demonstrations and essentially are used as bo- human shields in these larger protests that at a moment's instance turn into violent riots. Um, and that's what happened that I witnessed myself in Portland, but other cities, um, the, the riots that happened particularly at the end of May after the death of George Floyd was ostensibly under this banner of Black Lives Matter and racial justice. But there, w- there was really no way for these protests to not be uh, hijacked by violent extremists who did it over and over and over, and in the case of Portland, over 120 days of daily riots every day happening every night. Um, It since then has been now uh, weekly since about um, September. But this is an issue that's not going away. And people uh, assumed wrongly that after the election win of Joe Biden in November that you know, this is this is the end of Antifa. You know, Democrats coming into power that uh, we're not going to see an issue wrong. We had really bad riots in Portland and Seattle uh, just the day after the election. Um, you know, we were recording this just on the heels of what happened on New Year's Eve in Portland of uh, dozens and dozens of Antifa black bloc rioters trying to break into a government building in downtown with hammers, using hatchets. They came with explosives. Um, they were throwing explosives at police. Uh, they were... You, throwing homemade paint bombs that had been laced with a caustic substance. So, and the thing is, like, a lot of people also know my work through the the Antifa mugshots that I've been posting throughout the year, going through public records, finding out names, finding out charges, finding the booking photos. And I release all of this and I look into all of it because the overwhelming majority of these people, particularly in left-wing cities, have their charges dropped. So the underlying variables that have made Antifa such a destabilizing threat in some American cities, those variables are still here and they will remain to be here even as Trump leaves office in a matter of days. Mm. But I just want to touch on, so you use the term useful idiots about these people who go out and they go on BLM marches and all the rest of it. 
But it's not just people. These are also corporations, Andy. If you look at the Premier League, which is a football... Uh, it is football, not soccer. You need to know <laughs> that. Or, you know, which is our soccer league, which is broadcast right around the world. We have footballers taking the knee. We have Britain's Got Talent, where they had pictures of the Black Lives Matter fist. Why is it it's not just individuals, but corporations as well being taken in by this? Well, this is what makes the BLM Antifa movement dangerous, in my opinion. It's not necessarily these, on the larger scale, relatively isolated instances of street violence. They are isolated at the aggregate level. What makes them dangerous is that the ideology is mainstream, not just through mainstream Democrat politicians, but you look at corporations, you look at very big influential figures. I mean, you know, the mayor of, uh, of London uh, apparently approved having these BLM uh, fists logos, you know, blasted out on your New Year's Eve uh, fireworks celebrations. And that's, you know, nobody bats an eye. That's sort of just... He's all about unity, thing. Andy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, BLM, whereas, you know, they chant for police officers to be killed. Um in the case of Portland, nobody would come out uh, to criticize Antifa or BLM because, well, they believe that these people are fighting for a noble cause. And this is the thing, too. These corporations, these capitalist corporations who have benefited immensely under free markets are also then channeling money to many of these radical nonprofit organizations that are working really to undermine society. In the case of Portland, we have actually one Antifa organization called Snack Block who recently got nonprofit status. And they actually got 145,000 US dollars grant through the federal government that was dispersed to the state of Oregon and local officials gave $145,000 to this for ostensibly COVID relief. And then you go on the social media and you look, they're posting pictures of police officers being, drawings of them being decapitated, saying other, retweeting uh, promotional flyers for riot events earlier this year. And it's like, we are funding our own destructions here in the West, here in liberal uh, democratic states. Francis brought up the, the involvement of corporations, but as, as you explained to us the last time we had you on the show, one of the biggest problems in your city in Portland has been the fact that the mayor is also the police commissioner. Yes. Uh, and so until very recently, <laughs> he was very much on, uh, on their side, it would seem. Um, and essentially what I want to ask you is, how has this happened, Andy? Because, and maybe this is the Russian in me coming out, but... If people wanted to burn stuff down on the streets of Moscow, it wouldn't happen for very long. Yet this has happened in America for eight months. How has it been allowed to happen? Because we've seen police officers there trying to do something about it. We've seen even federal officers, I think, coming to some of these places. Why has it been possible for these people to set up autonomous zones, like try and make a new country in the middle, middle of Seattle? Why, how has that been enabled and by whom? So th this is what I mean when I say like it's like the acts, the consequences of mainstreaming the far left extremist ideology of BLM Antifa has real life consequences in that it's been very strategic in delegitimizing law enforcement in America to the point of where you have police departments in our major cities like Portland, uh, Seattle, New York, where they're essentially hemorrhaging. And on top of that, they're being defunded by the tens of millions. So in the case of uh, New York City, $1 billion was slashed from their budget with crime already skyrocketing. So there's one, on one level, a lack of resources in being able to respond. And that's what happened particularly this year in Portland with many officers either resigning or um, taking early retirement from the Port Portland Police Department. And uh, the Bureau is unable to bring in uh, new officers to replace what's being lost because nobody wants to go into now um, what should be a noble institution, policing, uh, when it's seen, when you're demonized, then when you are doxxed, um, when you get attacked in, 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 in some unfortunate cases, um, killed for political reasons. So, yeah, there's a lack of resources and then there's also the political involvement 
in these calculations from things that the mayor, let's say, of Portland, who's the police commissioner, but even beyond him, the city council itself, they exert immense political pressure over police departments, not just in Portland, in any city. So even though they are supposed to be uh, separate from one another, they are linked because if a police department has no political support from the city council and elected officials, it will really restrict what they're able to do. So in the case of Portland, um, in addition to the policing issues, we also have a so-called progressive prosecutor who is elected. So in, in the U.S., um, our district attorneys are also known as prosecutors. This is an elected position. So you can imagine if you are living in a city like Portland or Seattle where it's entirely left-wing and like and progressive, there's all the incentive in the world to be a prosecutor who's, who will be politically motivated in his or her prosecutions. That's happened in Seattle. And in Portland, we have somebody new come in who campaigned on a platform of restorative justice, which means essentially going easy on criminals. So in Portland, we've had over a thousand right-related arrest, arrestees, you know, that more than 90% have had their charges dropped. So the same people literally, and if you look through um, my posts of anti Antifa mugshots, these people being re-arrested three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, and it's just coming out, they're arrested in jail, they get let out with no bail, and they're back out, and their charges are dropped. So they just do the same thing again. But it's not just Portland, you're seeing that, you see that in other cities. So all of these issues are coming together to create... Um, it's a erosion of the rule of law and also like our foundational norms in society. One, that we don't solve disagreements through violence. Now people are doing that. And to the point of where you'll see commentators on news media, you'll see opinion pieces in our biggest papers of records arguing that property destruction is not violence. That is a mainstream talking point on mm. the liberal left in America. And it's over here as well. See? So... This is what I mean when I, in my book, that I say that this is what makes Antifa so radical, radical and dangerous. I'm not talking about instances of them rioting for one night or two nights, or, you know, Portland's quite ex extraordinary in that we had more than six months of, of nightly violence, but it's what it does to the institutions of liberal democracy. On top of that, you're, you know, you're having people now who they're openly physically assaulting people who have political disagreements with them and they're getting cheered on for it by frequently politicians, uh, mainstream media. They'll turn a blind eye to it. Um, so, like, I have... Um, I have a lot of despair in being in that, you know, my warnings to the city going back, the city of Portland and, and other places in America going back years. I've been writing about this issue for a long time. I didn't want to be right. And in the end, not only did, was I right, I actually underestimated Antifa. I, don't, I did not think that they could have done what they did, particularly in my hometown uh, in 2020, but that they were able to carry out six months of carnage and get away with it, essentially. Very, very few people have been held accountable. And one issue is that a lot of them uh, aren't, can't be identified uh, because of the black bloc. Um, but even then, frequently when they are identified, then their charges are dropped anyway. So, like, Portland is a harbinger for other places in America, and I think more broadly, tr obviously, what, what political trends happens in America, it's also then exported to your country. I think, I mean, BLM has taken root in Britain, and BLM... Thank you for that, Andy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're very happy. I'm sorry. We're very grateful. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you. You know, BLM, uh, you know, your country has an entirely different history and context for its mm. uh, relationship between uh, a police officer and the citizens. There's also the history of black citizens here. So, but for some reason, BLM has taken root here anyways. And um, this is why it, it's... It really is a worldwide threat, I think, to liberal democracy and um, the damage that it's been able to do in just a mere three and a half years uh, has been immense and the, the issues are not going away. 
uh, even after Trump has lost, we still have had continued riots. Um, there are multiple cities that had new, coordinated New Year's Eve riots. Uh, we're likely, it's going to continue because all, like I said before, all the variables are there in the so-called threat of fascism from the Trump administration was always uh, of a pretext, just an excuse used to ex- um, excuse their violent extremist behaviors. But if it's not one thing, it's another thing. You know, if it's not Trump, it's police. If it's not police, it's America itself. It's well, not- you see them defacing uh, democratic politicians' homes, homes now with things, uh, scribbling cancel rent and all this other stuff mm, on there. That's right. Yeah, we had, uh, they, this is what I've been trying. So I, I hope that some people on the liberal left in America will read my book because this threat to America is not just a threat to the American right. It's really going at the heart of um, American institutions, which includes the Democrat Party. So we've had, for example, on city council in Portland, one one of the new city council members, uh, there were Antifa rioters who showed up to his home and began breaking things because as punishment for him voting against defunding further Portland police. And he and he's a left winger. So, you know, they have these extremists, they have no issues targeting the left when they want to, and they do do it. Um, so their own stated goal is to essentially abolish America, abolish nation states. Francis, did you know that investing is one of the best ways to preserve your wealth over the long term? What's wealth? Something you will never find out as long as I have control of the trigonometry account. However, if you do have wealth, high commission and clunky products from traditional stockbrokers make it very difficult for people like me to start investing. Good. For everyone else though, Free Trade has come up with an award-winning app that is currently being used by over 250,000 people. It's FCA approved and FSCS protected. It's brilliant. It allows you to trade commission-free. Free Trade has won Best Online Trading Platform at the British Bank Awards two years in a row, 2019 and 2020. They offer no speculative products, no spread betting, no day trading. It, it's all about preserving and growing your wealth over the long term. No hidden fees, transparent price and structure, very simple to use. You can sign up for a general investment account or a stocks and shares ISA. Or sign up to Free Trade Plus for more advanced order types and a bigger stock universe. They've also got other new products coming soon. You can get a universe. Go to freetrade.io slash trigger, register and fund your account, and you'll get a randomly allocated free share worth between three and 200 pounds. Could be in a great company like Right Move, Apple, even Greg's. Greg's sold. When you invest, your capital is at risk. The value of your investments can go up as well as down, and you may receive back less than you originally invested. He knew that bit off by heart. And Andy, one thing that I really wanted to tap into is obviously you have Vietnamese heritage. Vietnam obviously has a very, very long and troubled history with the far left, communism in particular. Do you think that is the reason that you were more sensitive to these particular groups and you were able to see through their modus operandi, as it were, whereas American people who are your age or below have no real knowledge of far left politics and the danger that these particular groups can cause? Yeah, you know... um... Journalists are trained to remove yourself from the story for good reason, right? You don't want to make yourself part of the story on things that you're reporting on. But for me, as I was writing about Antifa going back several years, I just found that it was uh, extremely hard to sort of um, entirely remove myself in that my family's experience living through a communist revolution, going to prison camps, um, being persecuted for political, entirely for political reasons. Um, it mirrors a lot of what I'm seeing people on the American far left stating that they want to do, essentially. Um, Isn't that an exaggeration, Andy? Are they really saying we want to put people in camps? Are they really saying we need to, uh, you know, 
put someone in prison for 25 years for having the wrong political view. Are they really saying that? Is that when you embed yourself in their protest, is that what they're talking about? No, it's not exaggeration. They've killed people over political disagreements mm. in Port and they've mm. tried to kill and gotten themselves killed as well. People who say Antifa is not a deadly movement, let's look at what they've done, okay? In 2019, you had a man named, and I write about this in the book, um, Charles Landeros. This is in Eugene, Oregon. It's a small college town, very left-wing. He, shortly before going to a school and launching an attempted shooting on school resource officers, he had written anti-police stuff on his Facebook, kill police, kill pigs. Mm -hmm. And he was deeply involved in the Antifa movement in Eugene, and he got killed in the process of his attack. You had, later in the year, Willem van Spronsen, which is in Tacoma, Washington State. He firebombed a immigration's uh, facility and came armed with a rifle. He got killed in the process, but blew up a car. Um, there was Connor Betts in Ohio who killed nine people in a mass shooting who had a, has had a long history of Antifa activism, including in being in the Black Bloc. And um, just months ago in Portland, we had somebody who, quote, this was in his Instagram manifesto, I am 100% Antifa, following a Trump supporter in downtown Portland, waiting around the corner, ambushing him and shooting him dead right in the middle of downtown and then fleeing uh, to another state before getting killed by federal authorities. So, so, but Andy, those are all individual cases which I completely, un obviously very sad and shouldn't be encouraged at all. But that doesn't necessarily mean that because there's a few wackos in, in a movement, uh, that those people are then, you know, they're representative of the ideas behind the movement. That, so what we were talking about initially is, your Vietnamese background. And look, as someone who came, was born in the Soviet Union, Francis as well, his parent, his mother being from Venezuela, we get all this, right? But it, what I'm trying to get at is, are they actually saying we need to create gulags for wrong thinkers? They are saying that uh, when they aren't explicitly calling for their political opponents to be killed. Yeah. I mean, you just look, look at how they treat dissidents, uh, so-called dissidents of people who they suspect of not being completely on their side in, in areas where they've claimed territory. They beat up journalists mm. in their so-called autonomous zones. Mm. You know, they even had uh, one of my friends and acquaintance who was recording video in the Seattle autonomous zone. He, they saw him with the camera and they tried to pull him into an interrogation tent that they had set up there and he... <laughs> was literally, so, if your little autonomous zone needs an interrogation tent, might not be quite as friendly yeah. as you're pretending, right? Yeah, so his name is Kaylin Domaida, so you can go online and look at his testimony for that. But I mean, police were called, he was like dragged on the street literally before being escaped. So, you, you know, you don't just have to look at what they say, you look at their actions. They... Even though they say they are against governments, what essentially they do want to create is a totalitarian system, essentially where there's... Because their opposition is not just to people who say things that they disagree with. They don't want you to think differently, which is why they spend so much effort in getting people banned off social media. So exploiting the left-wing bias that is prevalent on in big tech social media companies, getting their opposition banned, um, getting them fired, doxing them, releasing information where they live, uh, work, et cetera, and, and terrorizing their opponents. So I don't think, you know, there are, there's a certain amount of parallels, and yes, there are differences, obviously, with like the Vietnamese communist regime from uh, the American context. But broadly, it is about a revolutionary far less politics about achieving their goals by any means necessary, including violence, including, I think, I actually I know if they had the power, they would imprison their political opponents if they didn't kill them outright. Because you just look at their actions on a small scale level and look when, when they've actually had gained power temporarily in Charles or in Portland's autonomous zone, what they do to people. Have you ever been abroad and felt out of place because you didn't speak the language? No, because I voted Brexit. Brexit means Brexit. I know that sometimes you're abroad, you don't speak the local language, it's very awkward, like Francis talking to a woman. So you have to shout, do you want to learn another language? I don't, for obvious reasons. But if you do, Babbel is quite simply 
one of the finest language learning apps in the business. Babbel offers a clear and easy to use interface. They have daily 10 to 15 minute lessons that have been proven effective across many studies showing that you can learn up to 14 languages that they offer. So it doesn't matter if you struggle with language. Maybe you find it difficult to pick up or maybe you're just English. Right now, Babbel is offering our fans six months free on a six month subscription with Babbel using our special code, which is, of course, Trigger. That's Babbel. B A B B E L dot co dot UK slash play and use the promo code Trigger. Look at that spelling. He learned English on Babbel. I did. But seriously, go to babbel.co.uk forward slash play, use our code Trigger, and enjoy Babbel. And Andy, who is a typical member of Antifa? Do they tend to be from one particular background or another, or are they spread far and wide from every echelon of society? It is spread far and wide. One myth that I do want to dispel is that they're all middle class, uh, wealthy people. That's uh, Some of them are upper class as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them do represent people who are university educated in white collar jobs. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And actually, the Antifa were so furious that I was publicizing these booking public records of these booking photos from these uh, six months of arrests in Portland because, you know, it exposed that some of them were in white collar jobs such as being nurses being doctors, being professors, being academics, being university students at private, expensive elite institutions. There's all that. But I would say it really, it includes, this is what, I mean, this ideology does appeal to people who are do well in America and as well as people who are really vulnerable. And this is kind of where my, I have a certain, I don't know if compassion is the right word, sympathy for some of these people who are used as tools, foot soldiers in these mass rights. People who are, many of them are, are vagrants. A lot of them are dealing with mental health issues. A lot of them are, have gender dysphoria. Um, and they're being pulled into a ideology movement that promises them community, meaning, purpose, uh, belonging. I mean, you have a uniform, you have an identity and label that you go under as a anti-fascist, so-called mm-hmm. anti-fascist. And they have a lot of literature as well, booklets, fam- pamphlets. Like if you read my book on mass, you'll see that the radicalization process is really important in Antifa. It's a lot of brainwashing, actually. And it takes a lot of brainwashing to get people who go from broadly being sympathetic to some of these things, let's say racial justice, to eventually being one of the people who mask up and bring, let's say, knives or tasers or Molotov cocktails and other firebombs to these riots with the intent um, to kill people. And this process happens um, not spontaneously, but through these radicalization stuff. And how does it happen? Tell us more about that. Just take us through, I'm a sort of disaffected... Radicalize us, Andy. Yeah, radicalize us into Antifa (laughs) live on air. No, but seriously, so here I am, I'm disaffected with society, I'm very progressive in my mindset, maybe I've I've got some mental health issues. Here I am, I've come in, and your job is to get me to the point where I'm ready to go on a riot. How, How does that happen? So there are, uh, let's say, I say in Portland, they have it down to an art. There are the street militants, and then there are other Antifa groups who don't explicitly engage in street violence, but they'll do things like uh, community events, support, uh, supportive, like, direct action, where they'll do things that ostensibly look like charity work, just dis- distributing food to those in their community, um, protesting peacefully, all of that, if you go to any of these events, in addition to the food and supplies that they're distributing for free, they will always have tables of their booklets. And it's very similar, actually, to, I would say, like a radicalization process of, like, the Muslim Brotherhood or other uh, Islamists or even jihadists, really. You introduce them to certain theories, theories about why why uh, capitalism is inherently linked to racism, how it's connected to slavery, and how America as 
and protecting capitalism, property, free markets um, is an uh, imperialist state of racism that support that um, upholds white supremacy. Like, in a lot of these ideas are actually um, they're in academic and intellectual, and they're simplified in these booklets and pamphlets that are mm. given out. Um, Nellie Bowles for the New York a report at New York Times, who, who went up to Portland to cover some of these violent protests and riots in Portland, wrote about some of these booklets and pamphlets. Uh, Antifa were really angry about that sort of like national spotlight that are brought to it, but there's very few people paying attention. Because if you walk by, you do think it's just another table of just like, things that people are handing out that actually forms a very important part in their um, how they're introducing what they call radical ideas to others. And in Chaz, they have the same thing in the recent autonomous zone in Portland. So, you know, you, you start building friendships. These friends start introducing these extremist ideas. They have gatherings and meetings. In the case of Rose City Antifa, which my book uh, publishes some of their documents for the first time, they will actually have a, a curriculum that's really kind of like a university curriculum in that they'll meet weekly uh, in a secret place. They'll have a set of literature that uh, they're each week you're supposed to read. They'll discuss it. Um, and and what are some of the central themes? So I've come, I've got a pamphlet, I've got my sandwich, I've got my pamphlet. I'm like, okay, well, yeah, there are problems with capitalism. Maybe it's because America is inherently racist or whatever. Now I've come to the meeting for the first time. What what are you telling me to get me into that? The main themes or the main points of their radical ideas that they're trying to brainwash people into believing is that uh, nonviolence empowers the state and the state enforces fascism, um, that uh, property rights is linked to racism, linked to a system of white supremacy. So these two things, hatred of a nation and hatred of property rights. Those are probably the two main ideas. And they have a particular hatred for law enforcement be because they view law enforcement, well, as the literal enforcers of the rules of the state. Well, right, if the yeah. state is fascist, they are then the fascist boots on the ground enforcing exactly. the fascist laws. So this state. whole using Black Lives Matter in opposition to police is just... It's, it's been a very convenient and perfect way for them to make their really extreme ideas palatable to a wider public. And they've had immense success. I mean, look at the calls to defund and abolish police happening in city councils across America. And Andy, they don't also, it's not just a process of indoctrination mentally, but also physically. They get taught how to fight. They get taught how to... Uh, various other things as well. Could you delve into that for us? So the really organized militant Antifa groups are extremely secretive because, I mean, they in, they explicitly, in, they have a membership process and in, in all intents and purposes, they are a gang and they will plan out criminal violent activity. So they keep all the activities secret and in... A, a press and media who unfortunately are very not curious have not dived into trying to uncover really how they organize. I mean, in my book, uh, I was able to acquire the documentation from the oldest American Antifa group, which is Rose City Antifa. Now, absolutely, if you look at their documentations, their emails to one another, it completely blows over this claim that Antifa is not doesn't exist as an organization, that they're not organized. I mean, the thing is Antifa is not one entity. There are many, many Antifa groups. There are networks of them. The Torch Network is the network that's probably the most violently militant. Uh, Rose City Antifa is a part of that, but they have chapters in seven other cities. So there's a blueprint for how they organize. And um, I think let's, what was really shocking about the the curriculum for Rose Day to Antifa, which you can read in detail in the book, is that they were holding these secret meetings at a bookstore in Portland. So on the outside, it looks so innocuous. You would never think that a feminist bookstore was allowing its space to be used by extremists, literal violent extremists. I would say it's it's a terrorist ideology, actually. You know, they, they spend so much time into brainwashing their members that 
violence is a necessity to achieve their goals. But you're saying they're a terrorist ideology, but in your book, what's very, very interesting is that you examine the antecedents of Antifa. And the fact is, like everything under the sun, this is nothing new. There was, I think, the Biden meinhof uh, group in the 60s, but there was also uh, the far left and the far right organization in Weimar in Germany in the, pre in the interwar years. Could you explain to us a little bit about that as well? Um, so since Trump has come into office, the uh, American press, the international press in, in Western countries has gone really overdrive into focusing entirely on, this, on um, threats to violence that come from the far right and white racists in really fringe, small neo-Nazi groups. Mm. And that threat is absolutely there, but it is small. But that's all that they paid attention to. America has had a history of far-left violent extremism that a lot of young people, people my age, aren't aware of the violence that we had in the 60s and 70s, um, which was uh, quelled or squashed because of law enforcement uh, imprisoning these some of these members, um, charging them. Uh, many of them fled abroad to Cuba where they were given um, uh, refugee status there. So... America has had a history of far left violent extremes, people who killed law enforcement, who carried, carried out bombings, for example. Um, Germany as well. And so there is this history in building blocks that Antifa takes from to do what they're able to do today. Mm -hmm. And there's just this, a gap in the collective American memory, I would say, of far left extremism that they think and, and that is actually quite intentional, I would say, about the media. They really, they downplay it and they ignore it entirely. I mean, you know, you can contrast, let's say, two mass shootings that we had in 2019 in the U.S. So there was a um, reportedly far-right racist white supremacist in Texas who killed um, some 20-something people at a Walmart and the people were majority of uh, Latino background. And that received a lot of media attention. Not one, because it was a mass killing and two, because of the um, potential racist links and allegations relating to that. But within 24 hours after that shooting, we had the mass shooting in Ohio from Connor Betts, who I talked about a moment ago, an Antifa mass shooter who if you looked through his social media history, was not just identified as part of it, but like explicitly calling for violence against the right. Um, he carried out a mass shooting and that didn't get as much attention or much attention at all. In, in and the is that all about Trump, Andy? Is, it, is, is, is this what happened? 2016, Trump gets elected, media uh, shocked, not only because it, he's, he is a shocking figure, to, to people on, on the sort of uh, liberal, what you you guys call it liberal, we don't call it liberal here, but on the left, let's say, uh, if you're a left-wing person in the media, to you, the election of Donald Trump is a shock to the system. And you're going, well, he needs to be got rid of by any means necessary. So you're sort of like, yeah, okay, look, th this stuff may be happening, but let's just focus on getting rid of Donald Trump. Is that is that what happened? It is what happened. Uh, I think Trump, deran Trump derangement sy syndrome is real, and you particularly saw it in journalists. Journalists who, uh, before his election, led uh, long, uh, distinguished careers, um, and at times may have been biased, but not to the level of what I would call really unprofessional behavior and reporting mm. that you see now. So surely with that in mind, you alluded to, to your opinion about this earlier, but Trump, you know, it, he's gone. Right, we've got a brilliant new, you know, mixed race ticket. Uh, racism is over. Everything's going to be wonderful. Uh, there is no more need for street violence because we're going to fix all all the bad stuff. Uh, if I <laughs> <laughs> that little laugh that no. you gave us. <laughs> uh, if only, if only that was the case. Yeah. The thing is, if you've been paying attention to the rhetoric of BLM and Antifa, particularly throughout 2020, it's sh it's shifted very clearly away from opposition to Trump to opposition to the United States itself. So they're not going to be satisfied until they can destroy anything and everything they can. So, um, you know, they have goals that really can not ever really be achieved in that 
if it's not one issue that they are protesting against, it's another, and if it's not that, it's another after that. It's, it's these people who can never ever be satisfied. I mean, when you say you are against white supremacy and fascism and you define it in the way they define it, which includes anything and everything, that means their goals can never be achieved. So they are always going to have a reason to be violent. They found a reason to be violent in Portland and uh, Atlanta and other cities on New Year's Eve. You know, because it's the new year, it's the new year to renew our dedication to fighting fascism and racism. So we're going to riot. We're going to bring weapons to downtown Portland. So, um, and I mean, if it's not clear enough that this is Antifa is a violent extremist dangerous movement, you can just look at like who they say that they are inspired by and take influence from, which is the original Antifa, which was a paramilitary of the German Communist Party. So that was the original Antifa. The logos that you see today or the flags was, is based off a design from that originally. So the original paramilitary of the German Antifa, they were engaging in street fights uh, in Germany, not just against uh, the brown shirts or, and fascists, but actually the social democrats. So fighting and beating up all political opponents. And they were creating this political climate of political polarization in Germany, in and towards Germany, and making the wider public just wanting all that street political violence to end. And I think uh, some academics have posited that that context helped pave the way for the appeal of somebody like a Hitler. So so what you're saying is these people aren't really anti-fascist, they're pro-anarchy. And chaos, yes, yes. And I actually, I think a lot of them are probably upset that Trump's going out because they really, they, they use that so well as an excuse to get, to bring in new allies. But they carefully have now switched the enemy from Trump to law enforcement and they've been successful in bringing out people there. And so, you know, all it really takes is just a very simple video of some unfortunate incident that is then taken out of context to mobilize not just thousands, but tens of thousands of people, uh, not just in my country, but your country as well and other countries around the world. Um, that's how effective their messaging has been. Um, and although uh, Biden is... in more moderate Democrat, um, you just, you look at the people who have influence in the Democrat party, people like AOC, people like Ilhan Omar, the radicals, people who are just state rep uh, uh, representatives in Congress, you know, one of many, but they have such an outsized and large influence on the party that their messaging will is going to play into the decisions of the DNC, in my opinion, in my predictions. And Andy, how do we defeat them? So you've, we've explained it, we've looked at the type of people who are involved in this uh, ideology, the fact that they're anarchists, that they want chaos, that they thrive on this. Obviously, it is not in our interest or anybody's interest that these people are successful. So how do we defeat, number one, the group, and number two, the ideology? <sighs> I'll start from easier of the two. Defeating the movement itself means is essentially doing what's been done in the past. So how law enforcement were able in the U.S. to end um, the terrorism of uh, far-left communist revolutionaries uh, in the 70s were to arrest, prosecute, and jail those who were involved in the criminal activities. And that hugely disrupted their networks as well. Unfortunately, all these people have been released from prison and have been reincorporated into left-wing activism and their, their past actions. People just look over their, their past criminal actions. Um, so there's that. You don't necessarily need new laws, although I think, um, let's say in your country, you have laws that uh, prescribe certain organizations and groups that are applied to jihadist groups, for example, and far-right groups. I think that should be applied to far-left groups. 
Uh, in America, we don't have those type of laws because of how strong our First Amendment is. You know, anything that could be interpreted as um, persecuting people for their beliefs, even if they are violent extremist beliefs, you can have those radical beliefs that's protected by the First Amendment. That's why it's not, uh, it's not illegal to be a member of a neo-Nazi group. It's not illegal to be a member of a violent Antifa group. So what needs to happen is the rioters are being arrested, though. They're not being held accountable. So this is an issue with prosecutors being elected. And I'm not quite sure what the solution would be but obviously it, it means people waking up and realizing that going soft on rioters just because they say they're doing it in a noble cause like that, that this really requires a paradigm shift, I think, in, in the American mind the, so that we elect prosecutors who actually uphold the law. And do you think it's a question of education, Andy? The fact that most Americans don't know about communism like we touched on before, you know, they haven't been educated about it, the dangers and the evils of the far left. Yes, absolutely. There's just not a lot of uh, knowledge. People aren't really aware that we had uh, far left communist Marxist cells in the 70s that were doing kidnappings and bank robberies and killing law enforcement and carrying out ex uh, bombing attacks. They just don't know about that. Whereas, you know, anytime you ask them about right wing extremism, everybody can remember things and they don't let things go and you know this is somewhat related uh it's just like um heather Heyer, who who was killed in in charlottesville like her name is regularly mentioned and it should be mentioned because i think her life didn't matter um but uh aaron danielson which is the person who was shot in portland nobody knows his name nobody remembers him nobody honors him none of the politicians uttered his name in portland when that killing happened so it's just and it was because he was killed by somebody who explicitly said he was Antifa. So, do you think that's it, Andy? There's a there's a lack of moral equivalence between the two because a, a far right extremist is viewed as as the most evil thing you can think of. They're racist. They're prejudiced. They're bigoted. You tie it to slavery in your mind. All of that sort of stuff. Whereas if it's far, someone on the far left. It's easier to excuse because you're going, well, they're probably well-intentioned, aren't they? They just want everyone to be equal. Like, mm. there's that lack of um, judging an act on the basis of the act because we we buy into this idea that this murderer is better than that murderer because this murderer actually used some kind of good motivation for their violence. Well, that and that's the problem. The problem uh, reinforced by the media is that... Um, that it's wrong to criticize both these, the far left and the far right in the same breath because they're not, they can't be compared because the far left, even if they are violent, they are doing it for racial justice, for equity. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, you, you know, you, you you go down that path of thinking the, rash, the rational conclusion is it, it does lead to violent anti-far extremism or any other type of Marxist terrorism um, because it's like, well, it's for this cause, right? The cause of... Um, uh, the proletariat, the cause of oppressed racial minorities. It's okay to kill police. It's okay to advocate for violence against these people because, you know, we're fighting for a noble cause. And for me, it's really immaterial, really, what the goal is that the, if the actions that are carried out lead to violence, murder, terrorism. So... Uh, I think I'm being consistent in my condemnation of the far left and the far right. I wish the media would be too. Um, and I think the other thing is that, um, you know, per me personally experiencing the the threats that come from Antifa that are directed at me make it more personal because then it's real. Like Antifa will write murder and, you know, around the city of Portland and that graffiti stays up in their autonomous zone recently in Portland they wrote my name and an address and that stayed up. So it's, it's unfortunate that there isn't very much solidarity with me from other people who are in the same field. And actually it's a lot of other journalists who frequently condemn me and de delegitimize my work. But you know, if any, any journalist, even just some contributor to a small publication received 
explicit threats from a neo-Nazi, the whole industry would rally against that person and all the press organizations would as well. I mean, I've, I've reported my threats to Press Freedom Tracker and other groups and uh, they used to get back to me. They don't anymore, maybe because it's become too frequent. Uh, report all the stuff to law enforcement. They don't do anything. Um, so, so is that why you've moved to the UK? I've had to flee uh, my country, my home, because of the ongoing threats and the lack of action from law enforcement, even when through my own investigations, I've been able to identify some of these people. I mean, people who pose with guns and say that bullets need to be put in me, all this type of stuff. Prosecutors choosing not to prosecute. I mean, you know, in my beating last year, you and I, we talked uh, just a few months after my beating last year. At that time, I was optimistic that they would lead to arrests. No, um, you know, we, through my own... Uh, Legal Council, this legal fund, by the way, um, Center for American Liberty, we had to finance our own private investigation, put in hundreds of our own hours into uncovering some of these people. And then once that information was provided to police and the attorney general, nothing was done. So unfortunately, we're having to sue them through the civil route when these people should be actually held criminally responsible. And probably, look, we can talk about you know the academic side of it and you know the you know the fact you know they're on the left and people don't want to condemn people on there for a variety of reasons and look isn't part of it just the fact that they're cowards isn't it just simple cowardice as well because it's difficult to do the right thing it's difficult to stand up to a bully and go you're wrong yes i have encountered a lot of cowards unfortunately doing the line of work that i do even I mean, this is this is an issue of, um, you know, and you two are not partisan, but uh, I myself am a conservative, I think, because of the political hegemony that the left has, in particularly in journalism, they make it quite consequen consequential for people who are critical of the left, even the far left. And... I don't know what it'll take for that to change. I mean, and I don't want the inverse to happen, by the way. I don't, I don't, I would not want to work in an industry, let's say, that was dominated by the right and a right that was unwilling to condemn far right extremism. Right. So a moment ago, you had asked, what does it take to um, defeat Antifa ideologically? And I think it's, you know, hopefully through efforts like what I am doing with Unmasked mm -hmm. in this, this book where I spent months and months at sort of the American epicenter of anti for violence looking at not just how they organize, how they get some of their funding, how they carry out coordinated mass violence, but looking actually, what do they actually believe? What does it mean when they say that they are opposing um, capitalism, when they're opposing U.S. imperialism? opposing white supremacy. What's that actually mean? What are they actually advocating for? And then we've had now, a, you know, a, a very clear view into what happens when their ideology is actually implemented in a territory. And it does lead to death, violence, the confiscation of property. I mean, in the Portland Autonomous Zone, this is really, this didn't get much as much media attention as the Chaz, but they actually create, so they created their own barricades, like what they did in Chaz, so they actually had a defined territory. They built a wall, you could yeah. say. They <laughs> built a wall and then they built a buffer zone that was growing every day. Every day it was moving further and further mm. out. And they set booby traps in the street, literal booby traps. Spikes, um, they were lay laying out boards with ha needle, um, nails sticking up. So you, could, you couldn't drive in. They had strategic points where they had bottles, um, Molotov cocktails, rocks that they could use as sort of their like attack areas. Mm -hmm. Like, and they were doing this, and this was the official messaging was that they were protecting a black indigenous family from being removed from their home, from being evicted from their home in the winter. It's absolute rubbish, it was a lie. It was a family who had been squatting at a property that they didn't pay anything for for three years, since 2017. 
and that the legal process had been played out. Court judgment after court judgment, appeals, rejected, et cetera, et cetera. These people were illegally squatting. And this, this was the people who, and they had stockpiled weapons inside this property. And so this is the type of people that they protect. And then the media just goes along with protecting a black indigenous family from eviction in the winter. Yeah, the coverage of, of this issue, I mean, it's been embarrassing from, from mainstream uh, publications, but which is why we're grateful to have people like you who can come and talk about it. And as you say, you know, Francis and I are not partisan on this issue, but we are partisan on nonviolence. We're partisan on the rule of law. I mean, I think everyone should be partisan on, on that sort of thing. It's very right-wing of you, Mike. Very, very. It's extremely right-wing. Well, it is seen as a right-wing position. Yeah, yeah according to, you know, people who follow, like, critical race theory and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, if logically, I can see it. If you think the state is fascist, and if you think property rights are fascism, then evicting someone from a property where they're squatting is, a, is fascism, under that definition. But to normal people, it makes no sense, of course. Uh, but as, as Francis said earlier, I think a lot of people simply don't know what they get involved with. To a lot of people, all of this stuff is simply about ensuring justice and equality. And those of us who try and sort of point out some of the underpinnings of this uh, immediately get boxed into, you know, all sorts of categories. But there's nothing we can do about it. What we can do, Andy, is thank you for coming back on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's good to see you are well and safe here uh, in, in this country for now. <laughs> Hopefully uh, this stuff doesn't come over too much. It's been good to have you back. And as you know, we've got one more question for you. Which is always, what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society, but we really should be? I like that you ask these, this particular question at the end of every show. Um, I wasn't prepared for it last year, and I I'm, don't think I'm that prepared this time either, but I think I have a better answer. I just... I think we need to be panicking about this erosion in the norm of nonviolence in Western liberal democracies. Like, it's not by chance that we have come to a civilization in a, a standard, a norm that you don't resolve disagreements through, through violence against mm-hmm. others. And there has been a very quick and systematic erosion of that, just as a norm, not through the laws, so that laws haven't changed in that regard. But I mean, when p- politics is downstream from, from culture, quoting Andrew Breitbart, so we're moving into a direction of a culture where more and more people are believing that the response to grievances is to be violent and destructive. You know, we sh- shouldn't just be talking about that more, we should be panicking about it, in my opinion. That sounds, that sounds like something we can all fight for. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I love it when Francis does a joke and the guest just condescendingly <laughs> looks at him. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a great ending to the show. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much for coming back. All the best with your book. It's out on the 2nd of February? Yes. It's out on the 2nd of February. It's called Unmasked. Make sure you get it. It's a brilliant read. There's a historical perspective. And as we've just talked about, Andy has been on the ground documenting all this stuff. So make sure you get Unmasked on the 2nd of February. Uh, and we will see you very soon with another brilliant interview like this one. This is probably going to be our last in-person interview for a while. So we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and we will see you very soon, 7 p.m. for a live stream or another interview. Thank you very much, guys. See you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our locals community using the link below.